delegates uh, to this session of rectal surgery with me uh, dr Ch uh, dr kishprat kudlu is is there dr chitrarama murthy dr abhijit singh <laughs> dr abhijit singh and uh, dr nanda patsasachi so we have eight papers and uh, First paper is uh, Femtolasic, the way to go, Dr. Vinod Uroda. Over to Dr. Vinod. Thank you very much. Thank you. So friends, uh, this is the first talk after lunch probably. You must be feeling a little sleepy. But just to wake up, uh, FEM2 has revolutionized the uh, ophthalmic surgery. It brings new precision, reproducibility, avoidance of many complications. So it's a new tool in the surgical armamentarium of us. The FEM2 laser second can be used in a number of ways air indications are rapidly increasing. It can be used in the keratoplasty, probably is the most wonderful tool ever happened to for uh, keratoplasty surgeons. This is just to show you the OCT after three months of, uh, and you can see the graft and host, it's almost disappearing. You can just see the strong bond there in the cornea. It can be used for making arcuate incision, it can be combined with the cataract surgery. It can be made independently also. So it provides very precise arcuate incision. Then intakes, it can provide perfect tunnel for putting intakes. It will be equidistant. It will be in proper position. So that makes the job much easier than doing it a manual way. Then femto cataract, of course, I'm not a fan of it, but somehow it provides clear corneal incision. We can do capsulotomy. We can do phaco fragmentation. And of course, we can make arcuate incision while doing cataract surgery. Intracore again for correction of press poipia. Then camera inlay again for press poipia. The smile is now is coming, catching up. The, my, my main talk is on femto flaps. So this new IFS laser has been designed to deliver biomechanical engineer flaps, faster procedure with lower energy, exceptional flap lift. There is advanced customization option and it has a very ergonomic design. The new generation of FEM2 laser provides very, very smooth bed. You can compare with the older version. It's much, much smoother. And you can hardly see any, any swelling or any is there. It's a very perfect, smooth flap we get. So what is the advantage? We have enhanced flap customization. There is more biomechanical stability. There is faster visual recovery. There is exceptional safety. And we have customized coronal capabilities with this one. Uh, small about the laser physics. Unlike excimer laser, it causes photo deception. This photo deception, it produces an uh, air bubble of carbon dioxide. And combination of these bubbles produce cleavage. So just I'm summing up, not going in much detail. So a resection plane is clear, uh, made. And similarly, we made a on the side cut also, we make, use the same pattern to make a cleavage. So it's basically uh, cleaving the two parts of the cornea. We have got two patterns, one we call the raster pattern, whether we start from the periphery, then we have the spiral pattern, we start from the center and go to periphery. The flaps are created in two parts. First, we make a horizontal cut, then we make the side cuts. And pocket, we make just to have uh, air to escape at that place. With IFS, we can customize most of the parameters. So we can customize the inch. We can have superior, we can have nasal, we can have temporal. And thickness, we can vary from 90, 120, 100, depending on the patient. So we got a lot of customization there. Then we can have the size. We can have a regular size. We can have an oval size also. 
Suppose your cylindrical number is 180 degree, we can just make an oval incision that will take care of uh, astigmatism correction also. And we can just change the angle of sight cuts. That provides another benefit. This is the application cone. We are putting it. I'm just uh, skipping the animation because I've given sh less time for this. So this is just to illustrate that it can, the peripheral knife fibers are not cut with femtolysic, and we get a much stronger cornea there compared to a microcrotum. It's more precise. We have control on thickness, diameter, centration, and minimal disruption of the biomechanical properties of the cornea. This is just to show you the variation of the thickness. Here we see with the thickness from 179, the center is 150, again on 187. The thickness is varies when you use a microcrotum. But with this, we achieve almost 90 microns throughout the cornea. So we get a planar flap. We are getting a planar flap. So therefore, the thickness of the edge and center is almost same. Now the side cuts, you see here, we have got a smaller area, but clear area with phantolysic. This is a big flap, but this area is interrupting us. This is where the microcutome. So in, a, in effect, we are getting a less, much less area to ablate than we are getting in a smaller flap with the phantolysic. Because this hinge is outside the flap zone. That's another advantage using this thing. Then elliptical flap, for cylindrical number, we can always have electrical flap, and it gives provides such much greater area in this direction compared to that one. So our hinge is protected, and we get a much bigger area to treat. This is shows another advantage of femtolysic. We can just put the flap inside the pocket we create. So the our our bed is coming little up, and our flap is going inside, so it makes the flap very, very strong. Unlike microcrotum where we have the flap is put on the ups, upside down like this. So it provides us a very strong, almost compared with the surface ablation. This is so much strong there. Then we have got a lot of femto flaps. Presently we have four or five companies which are marketing it. There's not much of difference between the two, but with interlace we have got certain benefits we can program all surgical parameters for personal flap. We can preserve the biomechanical properties, preserve the stroma to confidentially complete refractive process, regardless of refraction or corneal curvature. We can predict the precision of uniformity, planar flap, optimize intercorneal surface, superior outcomes, create the lasik flap in just 10 to 14 seconds. And it provides high speed, very high precision, accuracy, predictability, customization, it reduces risk of dry eye, less flop complication, there is faster recovery, there's a better outcome, especially in hyopropia, because we are getting a bigger zone. And in astigmatic nervous also, we are getting a much bigger zone, what we get with the microcrotome. So it's make a top choice for patient as well as ophthalmologist. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vinod. Uh, you have beautifully explained the Ben, by, uh, benefits of the less uh, femto as far as biomechanical strength and uh, stability of the flap is concerned. Can I have the next speaker, Dr. Arun Baveja? Uh, he's going to speak on complication and management of femto LASIK. Thank you. I have not covered complications because Dr. Baveja is covering that one. So no procedure is without complication. And uh, I think Dr. Vinod Arora has covered the topic very nicely. So I'll be carrying on the negative part of it, the complications which are inherent to any surgery. Now, femtolasic, just a brief introduction, is just like classic LASIK. The only difference lies in the preparation of corneal flap. In classic LASIK, this is the microkeratome does the job, while in femto, the, it's the femtosecond laser which makes the flap. 
and is the integrated software allows the surgeon to uh, determine the desired position and dimension of the flap, which is very flexible, unlike a microkeratome. The laser ray produces, this is a small introduction so that you know what are the complications which can. Laser ray produces tiny air bubbles and the energy of the femtosecond laser penetrates the outermost layer of the cornea until it reaches the desired point. The uh, laser now works like a scanner from one corneal edge to another one. Laser ray produces a tiny line of tiny air bubbles in a single plane, normally at a depth of about 90 microns as we do it. And like with classic LASIK, the corneal flap can be lifted using these air bubbles and folded on to one side. Now there are uh, various uh, femtosecond laser systems available. Uh, the intralase is the oldest one and which, which we are using. Coming to the complications, the most common layer uh, complication encountered is the OPL, the opaque bubble layer, the collection of the gas bubbles in the intralamellar space of the cornea. It's an undesirable uh, uh, intraoperative occurrence occurring during femtosecond laser surgery. OPL may interfere with tracking and iris registration. Although it eventually clears, it may take about 30 to 45 minutes to clear completely. Waiting for OPL to clear may delay the procedure. The LASIK flap lift in the area of OPL may be difficult. A dense bubble layer, especially when it expands ahead of the laser beam, may block the oncoming laser pulses in this region, resulting in an inadequate dissection. Location of the OPL and its time of onset during femto can provide useful clues to the level of energy applied in future. Now this uh, depicts the OPL. This picture has been taken from the night. This is another picture de depicting an OPL. This again shows the opaque bubble layer. This is another example depicting the same. Next we come to thin flaps and decentered flap. This uh, thin flap, this complication is similar in cause and effect to the vertical gas breakthrough. To verify a safe flap thickness, surgeon should use the bubble pachymetry technique prior to lifting. Decentered flaps, the uh, uh, things to avoid are pre-screen the patients to identify larger shift in angle kappa, mark the visual axis as a target for suction ring, eliminate all horizontal and vertical movements of the gantry as the cone is docked, Applanation is complete, verify that the suction ring assembly is level and do not accept an effective loss in flap diameter of greater than 0.5. This shows a decentered flap. This again shows a decentered flap. Then we come to something called gas breakthrough. A vertical gas breakthrough, although uncommon, uh, can occur if the laser flap is programmed too thin. Generally below 80 is when it occurs or if there is a focal break or a scar in the Bowman's membrane. Horizontal gas breakthrough occurs when pocket is overly efficient and gas is vented in quick bursts. Horizontal gas breakthrough can leave an irregular pattern on the stromal, blood, uh, stromal bed. The likelihood of uh, horizontal gas breakthrough can be decreased with good docking techniques and appropriate raster and pocket setting. This depicts a vertical gas breakthrough. Uh, then we come to suction break. Now suction break is a common complication encountered during your early phase when you start doing femto and management occurs in one of the two ways. Either the procedure is repeated immediately using the same cone or the procedure is abandoned and repeated after a period of days to weeks. Normally we wait for about six weeks before repeating it. In these situations there is a profound difference in advantage over an incomplete microkeratome flap in which abandonment is mandatory. Now the uh, procedure again it depends on proper centration, proper docking and proper suction before you start the procedure again. DLK is a common complication which occurs even with LASIK and is a non-infectious inflammatory reaction occurring in the interface normally one to five days after LASIK. This picture depicts a DLK. Another example of DLK. Then are something which are common complications to both LASIK and uh, Femto, that is photophobia and PLSS. These are rare phenomena occurring two to six weeks post-operatively. Patients can present with moderate to extreme light sensitivity, a good uh, uncorrected visual acuity and no slit lamp findings. 
Corneal perforation is another uh, complication which may rarely occur and uh, this, is, uh, this can be encountered with femtolasic as well. These are pictures depicting corneal, LASIK, uh, uh, corneal perforation. Then it's corrugated corneal stromal bed. Thank you. Thank you. What is this bubble pachymetry you were talking of? Bubble pachymetry is uh, recommended as a procedure of measuring pachymetry on the femtosecond itself. What on the femtosecond it? machine itself. I have not done it, but this is recommended in the literature. What, what, does, it what does it measure? It measures uh, the real-time uh, pachymetry when you are doing the femto. It's a sort of online pachymetry or? It is supposed to be online you, while, you, while you are doing the procedure. You, you first create bubbles, then you have a pachymetry. When you are doing the bubbles, you come to know at what depth are they coming. Thank you. Thank you. So we have got the advantage answer. of femtolasic that it's exceptionally safe. You can have complications, but most of the time can be managed. It can be reused. Or if anything goes wrong, you have got an intact epithelium surface. You can leave it there. And you can do it again, or you can do surface ablation, whatever is there. But it provides you exceptional safety. I think complications are way less uh, nowadays with yeah. uh, femto. Thank you. Thank you. Persons and dear friends, uh, I'm going to talk about the treatment of keratoconus with cross-linking and intracorneal ring segments. And though we have a wide variety of treatment options these days, these two still remain one of the most popular forms of treatment and possibly the most effective as well. Uh, so we know that cross-linking acts by causing disease control and halting the progression of the keratoconus. And the ring segments help you to have a visual improvement. Uh, this is a pretty standard slide where uh, the standard protocol was using a 30-minute exposure time. But now, more often than not, we're using the accelerated regimen, wherein by increasing the intensity, you can bring down the duration time to anything between 1 to 10 minutes. Now, we've done more than 1,700 eyes over the last eight years. And just to give you a brief idea of how they look, so this is how the keratometries respond. There's a definite flattening of the K-max, and we've had an average reduction of about 2.7. And you look at the astigmatism, there is also a significant drop of up to 1.3 diopters. Patients report an improvement of one to two lines in about 70% cases. The next option is the ring segments, which, as we all know, are clear arc-shaped segments made of PMMA, and they basically act by shortening the arc effect and uh, repositioning and flattening the cone. And they help to improve the CL tolerance. So we have two kinds of uh, intact segments, uh, ring segments that are there. One is, of course, the intacts. The next is the Ferrara ring. Now, the difference between them is exactly where they are placed in the cornea. So if you look at the intacts, they're placed between the 7 to 8 millimeter zone. So they're further away from the pupil. And though they cause a good effect, they cause minimum visual aberrations, which are actually supposed to be theoretically slightly higher in the Ferrara rings, which are closer to the pupil. And in between these two, we have the intacts SK for severe keratoconus patients, which lie in the 6 to 7 millimeter zone, giving you a good balance of a fairly good correction and, again, minimum aberrations. We use symmetric intacts when the cone is centered, and we use asymmetric intacts with a thicker segment lying towards the location of the cone. Now, how do you make out centration and decentration? So you look at the posterior elevation map on the pentacam, and when 50% of the cone lies within the three millimeters of the central cornea, it's a centered cone. When it lies outside uh, the three millimeter zone, it's a decentered cone. And if it lies outside the five millimeter zone, then it's a highly decentered cone. You also look at the K-max, and if the K-max is more than 55, then you prefer to put a SK or a severe keratoconus segment. And you also look at the superior and inferior asymmetry, and if that's more than 15, then you prefer to put a single segment. Dr. Shetty has done a lot of work in this. There are also various nomograms available. This is the one by Collins for Intax, and this is the one uh, for Kera rings. They all essentially follow the same principle. As you go up in the spherical equivalent, you have to choose thicker segments. And as your cone gets more decentered, you have to use, again, asymmetric segments. So just to share a few examples with you, here you can see that the cone is lying uh, within the three millimeter area. So we've put in symmetric segments in this case. And here, as you can see, it's lying outside uh, the three millimeter area. So we've put asymmetric segments. And these are a few pearls I'll just discuss with you. So lo let's look at the results. So you see a fairly good improvement in the visual acuity about, by about three to four lines. 
That's the sham plug image showing you the cross-sectional area. And this is how the results are. So now you have a definitely increased flattening in the keratometry. And this is yet another example of a very decentered cone. And here, as you can see, it's lying outside the uh, five millimeter zone as well. So here I've planned a SK segment of 0.45, and let's look at the result. So you look at the refraction, it's dropped from minus three diopters and 3.5 cylinder to almost half. And so has the visual acuity improved both in the unaided and the best corrected. Uh, complications as with any procedure, white cell reaction, vascularizations causing a corneal melt, perforation, can all occasionally be seen and have to be tackled carefully. Uh, there was also initially a controversy whether we should do CXL first or intax first, but we found that it's common knowledge now that if you try to, if you do cross-linking earlier, then putting intax in a stiffer or more rigid cornea causes a lesser flattening. So now as a routine, everybody does. First, the intax procedure. You flatten the cone, you reposition the cone, and then you make it more rigid or stiff in the corrected position using the cross-linking. So this is a short video. I hope we have uh, time for it. Uh, so as I said, you can have a good femto channel. You have already specified the depth, the location, the diameter, and you plan the incision at the steep axis, uh, making sure that you have at least a 450 microns of depth. And this is possibly the most important step where you go in vertically to open the incision. We also recommended that some people use a Sinsky hook to lift up the upper edge. And then you slide in the tunnel resector very gradually and make sure that you're in the right plane. Then you repeat it on the other side. At any time, if you feel that you're getting a lot of tissue resistance, then you kind of wait, withdraw, and then reinsert. And then the segment is picked up and very slowly inserted in the pre-placed channel. Now, this procedure can also be done using mechanical dissection, but ever since the advent of the femtosecond laser, most of us follow the uh, femtosecond laser procedure to put the segment. And then you pick up the second segment, and at any time, as I said, if you have a resistance, you pull back and then reinsert. That's the second segment also completed. At the end of the procedure, you make sure that the superior ends are at least 1.5 millimeters away from the incision to prevent future migration. And then you close the incision with a 10 nylon, bury the knot, and at the end of it, we scrape the epithelium and then perform the cross-linking procedure. Uh, let's look at uh, our results. So here are just a couple of examples. If you look at this patient, we followed her up for over two years, and you look at her refraction to begin with, and you see there's a definite drop up to one cylinder, and here she did not even need to wear glasses, and you see how remarkably her vision has improved both uncorrected and best corrected. This is yet another example where you see the astigmatism has dropped to more than half, and this is one of my most severe keratoconus patients where after the procedure, you find that the max K has dropped by almost 16 diopters, and the refraction has improved dramatically. So we've done about 250 eyes, and we found that there's a reduction of the K-max by about 3.4 diopters, and a change in astigmatism for about 2.7. So that's a significant gain. Not as good as a proper refractive procedure, but for the keratoconus patients, it's a distinct advantage where they get almost 90% patients will have an improvement of one to two to even three lines in some cases. And so I think a combination of the procedures gives us a very rapid and predictable improvement not only in the visual acuity, but also in the topography, you need to have very good case selection. You need to plan your cases well and counsel the patients that there will be only a certain amount of improvement. You will need contact lens rehabilitation sometimes, and uh, if there are complications, they need to be managed. But the good thing is that a single sitting procedure, you have caused both a disease control, stopped the progression of the disease, and given the patient a fairly good visual improvement as well. Thank you. Yeah, at 335 microns, you're at a very thin level, so you will possibly try to hydrate the cornea and do it with the hyperosmolar. 335 is very tricky. If you can reach uh, at least 350, though ideally 400, with either putting the still water first and then using the hyperosmolar riboflavin. And then in mostly in ectasias, I would plan a single segment. So what you have to look at is where are you placing your segment, and there you should have a thickness of at least 450 to 500 because you need to leave at least 100 microns of cornea below the intax as well. So you can't make your incision at 70% and then not leave because then you can have a uh, perforation. The other very important thing for an ectasia patient is that you sometimes the intact segment tends to go under the flap. So there again, in your primary dissection, you have to make sure that you're inside the flap 
so that your tunnel is created in the right place and it does tend to slip. So it is a tricky case, but it's the best you can offer to your patient. Make sure your consent is pretty good. You could, I mean, that, that's the next option, but if you talk about cross-linking, you would definitely give it a shot, and I think that's, that's what you'll have to do ultimately. I would put an SK segment depending on the astigmatism. A lot of us are now, we're just putting a single segment for the intact patient. The example I showed you, that was the Ictasia patient, where you just put a single segment, mostly works as best as you can. Like I said, they'll not come back to six by six, but from 660, if they come up to six by 24 with the CL, they become six by nine, that's pretty good. Yeah, thank you. So we have, it is clear, CXL and Intex both work well for uh, creator combined with those two brow tilties. Yeah, now I think next speaker, Dr. Monica Jethani, will be talking about reasons to look for unhappy 66 post of plastic patient. Uh, I think all senior uh, refractive surgeons are there in this hall. And uh, all of you would agree with me that even after doing an excellent refractive surgery, there are patients who are reading 66 on Snellens, still they are not happy. So there are certain reasons which we should have a look at before labeling the patient that this is a psychic patient, need a psychiatric reference. So the most common of them is uh, dry eye. And uh, patients having SPKs, if you give them a lot of lubrication, put them on gel, they'll be happy within two to three days. Uh, they'll come back to their visual acuity. Second thing is uh, there are certain patients who would complain of pain post classic and we feel that uh, it's a simple procedure why is this patient complaining of pain in such patients at times it's important to get uh, vitamin d levels done this is a recent study which has been done and uh, it has been found out that uh, in such patients if the vitamin d levels are low they need supplementation and this can uh, cure uh, them with the intractable pain there is one more uh, important study going on from Narayan Netrale, and uh, they are coming up with some strips uh, like we have right now for HIV, HBS, AG, and these strips would be able to help us to find out a correct candidate for PRK, for LASIK, or else this patient is not at all fit for refractive surgery. So in near future, we will be having such strips available, and then our life would become very simple. If we talk about corneal regeneration, uh, I personally feel confocal microscopy is the only objective way to know whether those nerves are actually regenerating and how much amount of regeneration is there. So this is, a, this is possible only in institutional setups. I think all of us should make a habit of comparing contrast sensitivity both pre and post LASIK. There might be a drop in contrast sensitivity, though it has been found that LASIK does not make much of a difference in contrast sensitivity. There could be some residual or induced astigmatism which may be bothering the patient. So that also we should have a look at. This is a well-known fact that before deciding our optical zone and treatment zone, we should take care of taking the scotopic pupil size, it should be a proper scotopic pupil size before we decide our treatment zone so that the patient is not unhappy post LASIK. We all know that after LASIK we might induce some higher order abrasions or there are certain higher order abrasions which are present and we have not taken care of. So it's very, very important that what patient we are dealing with, we need to do certain proper investigations and then guide the patient uh, what is the right choice for them. There could be some flap related issues like micro stria. The patient might be reading 6-6, but still there would be some stria which might be bothering him. There could be some peripheral epithelial ingrowth and even decentered pa flaps patients are not very happy. While ablating, we should protect, we should make it a habit to protect the hinge. Uh, there are two reasons, two main reasons for that. One is it can induce some abrasions. Second thing is it can cause a crater which will be a source for epithelial cells to grow. And if the epithelial cells are uh, away from the uh, hinge area, they are treatable. But if you have epithelial cells in those crater, then it becomes 
next to impossible to treat it because once you remove those uh, epithelial cells they regrow because there is a passage so they regrow so it's very important that we don't ablate the hinge and lastly in uh, prk patients haze could be the problematic uh, thing which is bothering the patient and after you have had a look at all these points there is a saying in gujarati because i am from gujarat there is a saying in gujarati jo baka zindagi che chalya kar se thank you kya sir very very important to ask for a history of associated allergies uh, mm. and also any systemic collagen vascular disease it's not uncommon to have ladies uh, young ladies to uh, with uh, uh, polycystic ovarian disease that's an important factor both for keratoconus and for pre op lasik thank you Simple things like NGD to fail. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very true. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. None other than Dr. Kamal Kapoor is going to speak on fake IUL. His favorite topic, I think. <laughs> Important is it's gaining more acceptance now. And uh, I've been doing these lenses for quite a long time. Uh, options available for the refractive surgeons this is one of the weapons in your armory but uh, i guess the more you use the more you get familiar with this it starts becoming your one of the favorite weapons in fact i was just in a debate 3 uh, weeks ago at the uh, iirsi noida that i was pushing uh, fake lenses for moderate moderate to a little higher myopic powers which are probably fit for lasik also you know 6 6.5 i'm slowly decreasing the bar because over time having done both i do both i do femto cataracts i do femto lasik i do fake ik lenses the best advantage of this particular procedure i guess is the reversibility and the quality optical quality vision which you can give to these patients so there is a definite evolution which is happening in refractive procedures i guess future somewhere down the line is we are looking at a fakeic implant uh of course lasik in high powers is definitely fishing in troubled waters you should be very cautious i just heard monica give a wonderful talk i would not go beyond less than 35.5 because 36 35 is a good cut off for me for a cornea being doing lasik for nearly 20 years now i burned my hands with best results six six patients the only thing which is bothering the patient is the contrast is gone let's actually see there are there are so many patients where you cannot do lasik so these are some of the patients dry eye keratoconus scleral malacia meibomian gland dysfunctions dry eye patients these patients of course you would not do lasik but fake ik lenses how did they gain acceptance the logic is that is actually cornea the problem when you are actually addressing a refractive power especially when you go beyond minus 6 minus 7 minus 8 minus 9 minus 10 and what are we doing we are actually curing the cornea whereas not broken we are trying to fix something which is not broken so this is where the concept i come from are we cutting something which could be spared we could spare this poor tissue it's a very fragile tissue so and lasik is associated with anybody i'm sure everybody here does lasik they are they are associated problems you could do the best lasik you know till the time femto came i'm sure you will nod your head when you lift the flap maker your breath is like this till the time you lift the flap so unpredictability was always there femto has come in it has made our job easier but then you do a perfect lasik next day morning you see micro stri and they might take time to go the patient is not happy the patient is not happy it's good that i'm following up to monica you could have done a beautiful job the patient is not thrilled so the complications of icl or oblique ipcl or any other fake ik lenses they are easy to catch you can catch them immediately maybe one hour post op maybe the next day or five days or one week until unless you have a very flat hanging uh, fake ik lens which causes a cataract of course but then again you can catch that on the fourth day i have done a study where i've done uh, seen patients with a good wall on the third fourth day i see most of the patients will go down by wall by 140 to 180 max wall decrease i've seen is 180 so again that's a pretty good time to catch it in within first four or five days one week you can catch your patient if something's going wrong if there's a rotation of the lens you catch it so you can catch it you can reverse it so that of course gives you a lot more uh, uh, comfort with the particular procedure the most of the complications you would have are sizing issues 
measurement, which is again a human error. So if you have a very dedicated protocol in your, your, your regime or your organization, it follows fantastically. We, I, I'll share the protocols we do. Another advantage is you're not changing the biomechanics of the cornea. The biomechanics are definitely altered. We have, you know, I remember there was, a, I've, I've been through those times when there was a cutoff of 250 micron. And then one of our fellow colleagues in the headlines of newspaper, I'm sure Sir would remember, it said, Indian eye is not fit for LASIK. And boom, eight months, we just did, I think, 40 LASIKs. We were finished. So LASIK has gone through ups and downs, and I guess new things will keep coming up. They'll keep shining out. What we need to do is we need to find out a stable system, have a customized flow chart. For this patient, I can do that. For this, I can do that. But there'll be some common overlap areas where the surgeon can decide according to his choice. So options in fakic lenses are you have you had the, the ICL, the granddaddy. Most of us have used the lens. Great lens, fantastic. A lot of issues with the pricing and the supply. But I guess that's what did uh, the good competition came in. And surgeons were not happy with XYZ features in that particular lens. And now you have options from the care group, the, the biotech and Appasami. I have no experience with the, the, the iCrill and the Appasami, but I think I'm one of the largest... Uh, uh, experience with the care group and a large, fairly large experience with the, the ICL also. Basically, they all follow a similar pattern, different designs, just that, you know, there are a few lenses which will have a right-sided, uh, like the ICL and the, the Icryl, uh, upper Sami lens will have a hole on the right when you put it, and the other two will have it on the left. What I like about a few designs is that, you know, they make sure that your aqueous flow is not compromised. There have been studies which are coming in that the anterior capsular cataract, as what we traditionally was thinking was, was the contact between the lens and the crystalline uh, lens. But there are studies which are showing if there's a good amount of aqueous flow, the oxidative stress on the anterior capsule, if it is not there, the cataract will not form. So even if you have a low vault, I have a patient which I shared yesterday, 180, 190 micron vault, I'm following that patient for nearly nine months. There's nothing which is going on. Be probably because the holes are big in the NIPCL. There's a lot of fluid which is going. The, the capsule is not suffering from any oxidative compromise. So we are getting, going, uh, getting away with that. So I think the time will tell us there are different delivery systems. I'm just trying to go very fast, sir. Yeah, this is important. People say that, you know, this lens is soft, it's, 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 it's bovine, you know, porcine columnar, this is a hydrophilic lens. The basic, each thing comes with its own benefits. A softer lens, yes, easy to insert, easy to explant, but how many times you need to explant? Let's ask this question. Number two, the wall stability in my hands I've seen is far better with a rigid lens. Once the lens has gone down by 140, 150 microns at the end of six days, I have not seen it go down, and I've got nearly three years, two and a half years plus experience, nearly 800 plus lenses now. The lenses are maintaining their position. Until unless the patient gets into a cataract and a nucleus sclerosis and the cataract starts swelling up, the ACD is not going anywhere, which I cannot say the same for the ICL. I've seen the ICL change its world at a time decided, planned, programmed by the lens. I, as a surgeon, have no control on it. Another thing which I was experiencing with the Earlier lens was the central hole, but again, that's a new story. That's a different story by itself. Power availability is a big advantage with these lenses. I've corrected up till minus 29 with two diopter cylinder. I've corrected lenses which we needed to go at a 14.5 white to white. I've put in lenses which are 8.5 diopter, 8.5 millimeter optic diameters. Now, I'll be sharing some of those. Uh, videos. So criteria for a fakic lens is very simple, just like LASIK, but what you need to do is you need to do your specular microscopy. For a beginner, it's a good idea not to start below 2.9 millimeters. I say 3 millimeters, but when I say 3 millimeters, a lot of my beginner trainee surgeons who come to me, unko bichar ko mokha nahi milta. Wo 3 millimeter wale kam hote hai case, to unko mokha nahi milta. To mene usko 2.9 kar diya. But you see, the thing is that point 0.1, you need to have a cutoff. I've gone far below that. I'm not supposed to say that because a lot of times I've seen my senior peers say that Kamal, you have told me that then the next person will try to do it and then you get tired and then you get tired. So I'm not going to say what levels I've tried to and got away with it. But 2.8 I think is a universal accepted norm. We should all stick to that. 
Now, sizes, as I said, 14. I've just done a 14.5 millimeter also. Powers, they go in half, half diopters. Now, now, one thing is we've done 686 this is, and 100 ICLs. 6.5 to minus 29 diopters, large sizes, any size, any power, any astigmatism. We just did a minus 14 in a post RK case. Just did minus 14. A young girl, she was a young girl, minus 14. The patient was 612 unaided. And she, she, she's a, a Canadian girl, and she's thrilled with the vision. Custom-made lens to this size. What you can do in such cases where you're using a very high cylinder, you want to be very sure that the lens doesn't rotate, go for a little higher vault. Go for 0.25 millimeter higher than what the company would recommend for you. Because I follow this nomogram. I go for a little larger lens. It may give me a little higher vault. 0.25 uh, millimeter higher would mean anything between 80 to 110 microns. Let's say fair square, 100 microns of an extra vault. But if you have space for that, you can go ahead with that. Now, points to see are very important when you do a fakic lens is white to white AC depth. White to white AC depth. Just keep ye mantra, yaad karlo. White to white AC depth. Ye jitna accurate hoga, rest surgery is just like your cataract. Any good average surgeon without having a lazy in his infirmary or his setup can get away and get be called a refractive surgeon. The only thing you need to remember is the anterior chamber depth is always never from the epithelium. It's always from the endothelium. Make sure you do that. You should make sure that, you know, the, the pupil size is another important thing. You should not have a resting pupil size, which is more than six millimeters. Of course, when you use lenses like IPCL, then manufacture lenses for you. I've got a 7.75 pupil size, resting pupil scotopic size, had an 8.5 optic diameter made for him. But yes, make sure. But one thing you must remember, if your pupil does not dilate in the OPD, this patient is going to be tricky to put in a fakic lens. So you better do a lot of cases before before you try pushing a fakic lens in a pupil which does not expand beyond 8 millimeters, enclavating the loop is quite difficult, especially with the hydrophilic lenses. Clear cornea measurements. Uh, we all have systems, IOL masters, uh, your uh, Pentacam, Cirrus, they all do that. This is very important. If your size is fine, the lens will sit in its proper place. But if you're given the company a larger size, they will make a large lens. And if you now actual size is smaller, the lens will fit tightly and it would forward vault. Forward vaulting means it will cause endothelial damage or it will cause crowding of the, the iris and maybe cause glaucoma. And if you have a smaller lens than required, but of course it will be flatter. If it's a toric lens, it will keep rotating in the eye. It will induce astigmatism and cause cataract. Now, how to do that? You could, whether you want to do a PI or not, I prefer to do a PI in most of the cases. I have a lot of friends who don't do PI at all, but still, I think I'm a little stuck up. I do still do one PI at 12 o'clock. I started with two PIs. This video is not working. One of the gold standards, it used to be said, was use a caliper to measure white to white. I would like to state, please change that. When you measure it with a caliper, you give it to three people, they'll give you three different readings. And if the reading is more than 0.2 different, it's no good at all. Suppose you have somebody saying 12.2, the other optometrist says 12.6, another person says 12.1, what do you do? So this should be a confirmatory method. So what we do is we use this. Better charge it. What we do is we go into the details. Now the best way to do that is the video is not working. So we use a Cirrus. Even on a Cirrus, I go on a manual edit mode, which means that I will check what the machine has said. I will go back to format and manually bring back the measuring scale again. Now, if it falls nearest to the which caliper reading I had, that is the reading I go for. Now, in case you don't have an access to these things, methods of measuring the pupil size, we make sure we measure the scotopic. The video is not working. Scotopic, mesopic, photopic, all three pupil sizes to be measured. Now, classical, this is one case where in a light, lighted room, the, the size says 3.72 as scotopic, 3.03 as mesopic, and 2.64 as actual complete lights on. But when we switched off the lights, see what happens. The pupil goes 6.75. So make sure the person who's doing these measurements for you is aware of these nuances. Most of the times we leave it to our optometrists who are not well trained. So they will not know the significance that scotopic means pura andhera karna hai. Mesopic means aapko at least you should have a CFL somewhere behind the patient in a room. 
So these things, we've evolved over time, so all my centers have a protocol written when these measurements are to be done. This video is not working, it was working yesterday, something has happened. What we've done here is, no, you, it's, it just says cannot play, I tried that. No, it says cannot play video, I tried it, I was trying it there. So what I do is, I bought auto refractocarometers, which are equipped with a pupil measuring bar. The most simple thing you can do is, we'll go to the next, I've taken a snapshot of it. So I take this, this bar, I take it to the edge of the pupil, and I get my pupil size. So the video actually shows the differentiation in the size when you switch on the light. So I base mark it, then I switch on the light off, just to explain to my optometrist that this can make so much of difference. This can go to 6.75 from 4.5. So we take the baseline with the light switched off, and the same thing, the same bar can be moved now to take white to white. You don't need high-end equipment. So you can use an auto refractocaratometer coupled with your digital caliper to give the sizing to the company. In all the centers, I, I have different centers in Delhi. Not all are equipped with, with an Isle Master or a Pentacam. So this is what we've started following. We did a study of 60 eyes side by side it's nearly different by 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and with 0.2, it doesn't make much difference. So this works. So you see, you get 11.7 millimeter, white to white. This is the worksheet, detailed worksheet, gonioscopy done, PI done, all measurement. Now you see, different methods are used. White to white from axis, caliper, orb scan. They're all falling within the same range. Great, good to go. But if this, there is a variation of 0.3, it goes back again to the workbench. So it should be very meticulous. Once your measurements are clear, anybody can do these lenses. Next thing to do is make sure your vaulting is test tested. Vault means the distance between the, the IPCL and the ICA and your crystalline lens. This should be approximately anything between 300 microns to 750 microns. These are highly vaulted lenses. This is immediately post-op lens. There's some viscoelastic behind. You can actually see this vaulting is there. Don't worry, send the patient home. I would recommend don't use pilocarpin in such patients. If you anticipate a higher vault, don't use pilocarpin. There's viscoelastic. This will automatically go within two days. If you put pilocarpin, these are the patients who probably will have a higher IOP and IOP spike. The best way to check your vault is, in case you don't do an OCT, is the cornea thickness, the thickness of the cornea, the same thickness you should get between the crystalline lens and the IPCL. Approximately 500, 600 microns, great to go. 488 microns, this is what is meant by a vault. So these are different situations, flat vault, very low vault, low vault, high irregular vault, which means the enclavation is not systematic. When you do a OCT and you see the lens tilted, which means you probably need to go in, one of the legs, one of the loops of the lens is not back folded, it's bent. So when you see an irregular uh, tilting, never leave the patient like that because these patients are in for trouble. They will have peripheral cataracts. As I said, the pupils should be very well dilated before you actually take these patients up. Marking, you can do a two-step marking, but with these newer lenses, smart lenses, you don't need to do a two-step marking. 0, 0,180 is where you place the lens. Just mark 0, 0,180, the lens comes manufactured. Suppose the patient has got plus to, uh, minus 3 at 80 degrees, the lens is manufactured at minus 3 at 80 degrees. All you need to do is place the lens at 0, 0,180, and the lens does the work. Do not mark the conjunctiva. Never mark the conjunctiva. You could have an error play of 5 to 12 degrees or 15 degrees at times. Always mark the edge, the limbus, secondary marking. What I do is I use a slit lamp. You could use a gratil tool or you could use a slit lamp. Just make the beam to 13 millimeters, thinnest slit. Make the patient, make sure the patient's head is straight. Align the optics. And even in a, earlier I used to do it in undilated pupil, then dilate. Now what I've started doing is, I just, uh, there's a video, I hope this, this video should play, this is interesting. So even in a dilated patient, you see, the necessity is the mother of invention. So as time went, video all right? Anyway, what you do is, you align it to 0, 0, 9, 0, 0180, ask the patient to look straight into the light, and the Purkinje image, the cornea, the lens, both images should be in the center of the beam and these two edges. So all two spots on the edge of the limbus, the Pukinji image and the, the cornea reflection all in straight line, mark the cornea on two sides and bang on your 0180. You cannot go wrong. The video is not working, but it's, it's, it's showing out here. So primary axis as I said, smart lenses. Now these are lenses I was talking about. 8.5 millimeter diameter. Look at the size of the lens. 
is a huge pupil, high myopia patient, minus 29 also. And these lenses are, see, manufactured. The axis, two diopters at 88 degrees. It's a customized lens. What better can you get? You just place the lens at 0, 180 and it works. Life transforming surgeries. Look at the patients, happy patient. We could never do anything for such patients. High, such high myopes. Minus 16, minus 12, brother, sisters. Minus 20, 18, we do two diopter cylinder. So the, the fakie lenses, I guess, they are here to stay. They will help not only our high refractive index uh, error patients, but also patients where we cannot offer LASIK for them. Thank you. Good. Uh, Dr. Um, Kamal, what's your experience with uh, hypermetropic, uh, with IPCL? Sir, I have done 11 hyperopes. One, I needed to explant because the patient got cataract. The vault was, again, not to mention 2.6. 2.6 was ACD. I tried to get away with it, but I told the patient that we might want to... He, you know, this was a lady who said, Dr. Sahib, I don't have original lens. I said, I have pre-lex, multifocal. No, no, I originality maintain karni hai. So I said, we are doing very shortly you will get cataract, but I think at the, at the end of maybe one and a half months you started getting cataract, so we had to explain that. Other hyperopes are doing fine, no issues. I think the issue with hyperopes, Dr. Vinod, I would, is probably the antechamber. They're very rare to get very to rare. Point eight, so, really. uh, to so point most four, of that's why point most two. of my refractive uh, in hyperopes is a clearance extraction correct. with a multifocal lens. Agree. And only Absolutely. few patients you are able to get away with. Correct. That was one. The second thing is uh, when we actually did a small study comparing visual acuity in uh, in terms of uh, the aberrations with wavefront guided LASIK versus ICL for the similar powers. Small study, but 15 eyes in both. But what we found was in LASIK, the amount of aberrations, contrast sensitivity drop is a lot more. Because every time you even cut a flap, you induce aberration. Absolutely. That is one. The second thing is they've actually, for higher powers, I'm talking about minus 6 to minus 20, there's a beautiful Cochrane Amazing. review. Uh, from out of um, the Moore fields, which they actually looked at in terms of visual equity improvement, very similar. LASIK and uh, ICL are very similar in terms of visual equity but improvement, but contrast sensitivity and chance of the patient dropping two lines of visual equity is more in LASIK. So for higher powers beyond six, I think there is probably no You see, this argument. is what I actually was, I had a debate, as I said, and yeah. people were actually saying beyond minus 10 do fake lenses. And I brought the bar down. I said, beyond minus six. We just operated a couple who done the net search on LASIK. At 3.5, they wanted a fake lens. So, so the information is percolating down the lines. People are coming and asking for it. Basically, Please. it's the quality of vision, Absolutely. which matters, not a quantity yeah. of vision. Please. With ICL, definitely because you're not touching the cornea, you're not doing any, causing any abrasions, the quality of vision is better. Secondly, we've seen if you buyer the white to white with the oil master and do with the digital is there's a, always a variation is always less less and the, the company says 0.5 500 is uh, point lesser three. than that 0.3 to 0.4 uh, yeah, so, so uh, there's no one very, method very of measuring white to white except ubm uh, yeah please can you come here how do you calculate the uh, power of the fake eye well accurately? How do you calculate the, the power? power? The power is the refraction of the patient. That's yeah. the best part. It, you can go wrong when you're doing a prelex. You can go wrong because biometry, which formula do you use? Sometimes you're stuck up at 21.98. Whether you go a Hagis, you go Hofer Q, you go SRKD, you don't know. And some patients do well with Hagis, somebody will do well with the Hofer Q. Yes, well, yes, hello, yes. here you're just attacking the refraction. You don't need to do anything. There's no formula there. That's another plus point. You're actually, actually saying what I said in that debate. Thank you. It is a refraction, always a refraction. So we got a time, Mikkel. I think we can have any one or two more questions. Please, yeah. yeah. Any number of questions. Well, you said initially it is to do the viscoelastics, the high vault you have. Suppose viscoelastics washed away, still the vault is high. The many of the doctors, the surgeons now recommend that you rotate the lens from the horizontal to the vertical. If yeah. it's a non-toric lens, yes, it works. You get a bump down by but nearly 200 microns. You rotate it yes. vertically, that's a beautiful point, you brought it up. If you rotate it vertically, but sometimes if you have a cylindrical part, you're stuck up. No, another no. thing is, another thing here is uh, viscoelastic, uh, since you brought it up, I had one case where I thought the patient got a cataract, and the patient looked like having a cataract, anterior polar cataract, and one of my junior doctors said, Sir, it's cataract, it was my second case, tha, aur to ye ho gaya. I said, wait, wait, wait. We did an OCT, it was nothing but retained viscoelastic, which went white. Yeah. So what we did, we dilated the patient for a week, 
and put him on steroids and the the so called cataract disappeared so be, before jumping for explanting make sure do an oct you will definitely see more opacification of the anterior capsule if it's an anterior polar cataract and you will see a white blob on top of the crystalline lens if it's a retained viscoelastic yes. Uh, uh, do but you it, do but the vertical uh, white to white will be different so it does it, it work? is it is again i think this is a beautiful discussion we are having yeah. whenever you have more than two diopters of astigmatism please measure vertical white to white also oh, because this can cause rotation this will help you to decide the world now in case you ever have a higher astigmatism i personally bump up by a factor of 0.3 in my total size because जब जब साइज टेढ़ा होता है तो सर वो उसको पुश करके रोटेट करने का कोशिश करता है सो यू गो फॉर अ लिटिल लार्जर वर्ल्ड देर इज अ नोमोग्राम फॉर दैट देर इज अ नोमोग्राम दैट वॉन्ट टू सपोज यू हैव अ हायर एस्टिक मैडिजम गो फॉर अ लार्जर लेंस गो फॉर अ लार्जर लेंस इफ यूर ए सी डी परमिट्स ऑफकोर्स इफ यूर ए सी डी परमिट्स गो फॉर अ लार्जर लेंस सपोज यू हैव अ थ्री 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 मिलीमीटर ए सी डी एंड यू कैलकुलेटिंग अ वॉल्ट ऑफ मे बी फोर हंड्रेड गो फॉर अ लार्जर लेंस इन केस यू हैव एन एस्टिक मैडिजम No problem having a 650 or a 700 watt. No problem. So uh, any Dr. Kamal, you said you do radiography or seven days earlier than the surgery. Do you do this radiography for the star surgical lens which have holes in, in the center or? Sir, uh, are you talking only? I I, I do. I used to do a lot of ICLs, and I needed to. The worst was I needed to explant the ICL for nothing but glares. That is the time I took a step back. and i actually you know uh, i believe yesterday there was some uh, monica talked about that i'm sure most of us are experiencing it our, our patients are saying it to us but we are using what i call is a selected filter we're not hearing it from our patients no listening but you start using a lens which doesn't have a hole in the center and then you will know what i mean uh, we also presume that uh, the center hole must cause sir, some problem sir there are some patients out there which you and me don't know when yeah. they are sitting in our obd chair that this patient will come and eat half your right cerebral cortex we don't listen to them actually we have a pre <laughs> prefixed of mind we don't listen to so them so the patient says mere ko glare hota hai mujhe raat mein dikkat hota hai kare nahi nahi nah, nah, theek ho jayega tear drop dal do ye dal do alpha gan de do pupil chota kar do wo nahi jata hai sir jisko hona hai usko hona hai to fir hole ko khatam kar diya what do you experience with the, the lens open upside down what do you do in sir again uh, or... these are loading issues i have only okay. one one experience with the icl opening upside down at a point where uh, the, the the ot technician gave it to me i didn't wasn't careful i just pushed it down but after that day i load all the lenses when i am doing the surgery at least myself there's one trick which i do is uh, people have reported especially using a hydrophilic lens that they get a anterior cataract because the lens rubs on the surface two simple points make sure you go parallel to the plane of the rs don't push it like you push in an iol that's the biggest mistake we as cataract surgeons do we go vertically go towards the pole of the capsular bag don't do that aim at the equator on the opposite side point number 1 point number 2 is i've seen most of the people put their ipcls like this i put it like this i put it reverse i back fold it so what happens it it actually opens up like a bird like this if if the lens opens like this it rubs the anterior crystalline lens when it opens so i back fold it you mean my this? cartridge the lens is like this most of the surgeons are folding it like this so when the lens opens it rubs the crystalline lens when it opens especially when you are using a larger dia more than 6.75 you are talking of ipcl or icl ipcl I see. I see. Normally, the vault is upward. No, sir. It's not the vault. It's the, the lens. Opening. It's how you load it in the folding of the lens. Cartridge. No. You while can actually roll the lens like the, this. While, while you're loading, the lens is like this. Sir, आप उसको sir आप उसको ऐसे भी roll कर सकते हो cartridge के अंदर और आप उसको ऐसे भी roll कर सकते हो. आप अगर ऐसे roll करोगे back fold तो वो कभी भी crystalline lens को touch करके नहीं खुलेगा. कभी भी नहीं खुलेगा. Of course, wrong upside. आप उल्टा लोड कर देंगे तो वो ऑफ कोर्स उल्टा खुलेगा. My question was, what do you do when it is opened uh, upside down? You take it out. You Very good point. Out, you... If you can catch the hole opening on the right or the left side, whatever lens you're using, till the point it's nearly sixty percent in the eye, you have enough time to pull it back. No, you just pull it back. Now, in case it has gone in, you need no. to make your incision point three millimeter larger. then pull the lens out reset it and put it in again you can't don't try to no sir no never do that no. never do that never i have no. done number of times no, no, that sir. should not You're be lucky. that should not surgeon. be done gifted surgeon i do i do
it's much easier to bring it out bring especially it out, with the icl it, peace of mind especially with the icl it's much easier to bring it out put it uh, do well, it with the ipcl also sir it, 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 okay. you can do that not my experience that. you can do that <laughs> rotating it in the eye can be trouble if not your lens you could peel off the endothelium uh, not endothelium because okay. sir, sir let's face it we have an acd which says it's 2.8 and we have a lens which is 6.2 you are rotating it and it probably at the stage you are doing it the lens has opened by itself totally yeah. so you have 6.2 mm lens rotating it 2.8 it is going to rub something in so this situation i feel the crystalline anterior capsule will be more, far more forgiving with the icl but the endothelium will not be that with the mechanical stress will peel it off and if you do that in the center the visual axis you are finished dr kamal any experience with ipcl as a piggy bank lens as piggy yeah, bank i just did a talk in another hall yeah, yeah. I, okay. I, just, i just i want to have share you tried it have you tried it uh, I, I, i have i have done presbyopic piggy bank i have done presbyopic piggy banks ipcls <laughs> yeah i have done i i, I have a presentation for that uh, what i did was um, the company came came up with a progressive uh, uh, presbyopic ipcls and um, i had one candidate my ot technician i had operated him 8 years ago both eyes monofocal one of my favorite ot technician but he's instead of a chopper he's giving me a lesser manipulator because wo washed up hota hai uska chashma upar niche ho jata hai he puts a micro pore to make sure chashma upar niche hi ho jaye wo bechara nahi hota usse to jaise a lens aaya so i told this guy ahmed his name is ahmed so i said ahmed bhai main aapke lens dal raha hu aur explain karna hoga to main explain kar dunga i put it in one eye he was plus 1.5 hyperopic in this eye so i put a plus 1.5 for distance and a near out of 3 multifocal progressive piggy back pseudo fakey gene and he said wow sir maza aa gaya so the second i i did in dos live surgery for the company uh, we did a live surgery sponsored by care group and i put the second i and after that day he's never handed me a wrong instrument so Thank that you. gave me a lot of confidence then i started doing in my private patient now what i do is i need to share with this group we've just opened a new bank all the patients who are happily operated by you and you thought that bank account is closed it's open again they come back to you you do a piggy back multifocal okay kamal everybody would like to listen you for uh, any period such interesting and the uh, talks you have interactive nobody likes to stop you but the time stops us so with this and we come to the end of this session which was quite interactive thank you all once again thank you very much